Hello and thank you for joining me here at Why the Book Wins, where I compare books with our movie adaptations. Today I am talking about The Gin and the Nightingale's Eye, which is a book by A.S. Byatt, published in 1994. And the movie adaptation is 3,000 Years of Longing, which was directed by George Miller and released 2022. And I actually went into this movie, I was super excited about it and I saw it the weekend it came out, but I did not realize it was even based on a book until the credits started rolling. And as someone who does book first movie comparisons, I was like, wow, how did I not know this was based on a book? Anyway, so as soon as I went home, downloaded the book, read it, and here we are today <laughs> filming this book first movie. And I would highly recommend this movie before I get into the comparison where I will be talking about spoilers. I do want to say that I would recommend this movie. I did really enjoy it. It is amazing visually and the music is incredible and the performance are fantastic and it's just a great story. So I do recommend seeing it. And I do think after you do see it, I think it helps to watch this video because I do get into what makes it such a great movie because honestly, initially I was a little little disappointed, which we'll get into later in this video, but the more I've sat with it and then after reading the book, it's given me a whole new appreciation for it and I highly recommend it. So definitely go see it in theaters. But the summary for this is we have a British woman narratologist who is traveling to Istanbul for a storytelling conference. And while she is there, she goes to a shop where she finds this cool glass bottle. And when she is later in her hotel room cleaning it, a djinn appears out of the bottle and tells her he can grant her three wishes and they must be her heart's desire. And while she is trying to decide what to wish for, the and tells her about his life and about the past 3,000 years with him, his experiences in and out of the bottle. And a djinn is a genie. So in the book and movie, they refer to him as a djinn. So that is what I will be calling him as well. But djinn and genie, it's the same thing. Anyway, his first time being trapped in the bottle is when he was with the Queen of Sheba. He was part of her court and he was in love with her, but she ends up marrying Solomon. And then Solomon traps him in the bottle and throws him out to sea. And then a long time later, he is found by this woman who is part of a harem. And she wishes, her first wish is to be noticed by the prince and for him want to be with her. And then her second wish is for her to be pregnant with his baby. And then she dies before before she can make her third wish. And when someone doesn't finish their wishes, it causes the djinn to be trapped in this weird limbo. Like he's invisible. He's just like stuck in this weird limbo state and people don't see him unless they are part djinn as well, which we'll get into. But anyway, he ends up being found by this woman. She finds his bottle because his bottle had been hidden. Anyway, she finds his bottle and he appears, but she doesn't trust him. So she wishes for him to be back in his bottle. She tosses him out to sea. Long time later, he is eventually brought to a woman named Zephyr and he and Zephyr end up falling in love. However, his love for her is kind of controlling and so she ends up wishing that they had never even met and he is in the bottle and so once she makes this wish, he is once again stuck in the bottle and he is trapped there until we reach present day when the narratologist finds him. And in the book, the narratologist is named Jillian. In the movie, her name is Alethea and that is Greek for truthful. And I will be referring to her as both names depending on if I'm talking about the book or the movie so I'll be switching back and forth. I don't want to make it confusing, but yeah, Athea, Jillian, same person. And in both we learned that she went to an all girls boarding school and that she just had a hard time making friends and she calls herself a solitary creature. She created an imaginary friend while she went there. It was an imaginary boy and he just kept her company and brought her comfort because she struggled with asthma attacks and had to be hooked up to a machine. And she ends up writing about him when she was a girl and she wrote in this book just creating all these details about who he was. But then she started to be embarrassed about this because it was so detailed and she burned the book and then the friend imaginary friend just kind of disappeared after she burned that book. And I'm going to read a section from the book which talks about this reading. It seems silly in writing. I could see it was silly. I filled it with details, realistic details, his underwear, his problems with the gymnastics, and the more realism I tried to insert into what was really a cry for desire, desire for nothing specific, the more silly my story. It should have been farce or fable. I see that now. And I was writing passion and tragedy and buttons done with verisimilitude. I burned it in the school furnace because my imagination failed. And in the book, we learn that she burns this book and that imaginary friend disappears. However, later another imaginary friend appears, but she doesn't write about him. But I think he too kind of ends up fading away. But in the movie, it's just this one character, this one imaginary friend that she had written about in her book. And then we also learn in both book and movie that she had been married, but her husband ends up leaving her for another woman. In the movie, we find out that they had been pregnant. She had been pregnant with their baby, but it didn't, they lost it very early on. And it seemed like soon after that, he left her and he told her it was because she was incapable of feeling. And she tells the djinn that she feels things 
through reading stories. But in the book, she actually had two children with this husband and they were together for a considerable amount of time. And then at some point later, as they were getting older, he left her for someone considerably younger. But she says how when she found out that he left her, she didn't feel the sadness or anger she should have been feeling. And she like noticed like, I should be feeling these things, but I'm not. Instead, she just felt free. And she talks about feeling free as well in the movie when her husband leaves her. And yeah, I thought it was interesting that in the book she does have children, but she's not close to them because they're adult children living their lives and they just aren't close. And that almost seemed sadder and more lonely because I don't know, it's lonely to not have children at all, but then to have children, but you're not even close to them seems sadder, I guess, in my opinion. But, but yeah, even though she is divorced and she was happy to be divorced and is very content in her life, she does struggle with loneliness still. But a big theme in this book, which by the way, the author, it's her initials, but it is a woman who wrote this book. And a big theme in the book is woman in stories and just woman living in a quote unquote man's world, I guess you could say. This book was published in 1994 and the author was born, I think it was like the 30s. So she definitely experienced this more so back then. And then, yeah, like I said, this book was published in 1994, but it like takes place in 1991. Getting back to her marriage, like she didn't like being married in some ways because she wanted the independence of not being like tied down to a marriage and also society believing like a woman should be married as well. And that's kind of similar to the Queen of Sheba because she didn't want to be married because she had the power and she had everything she wanted. And so she was kind of like, why would I like quote unquote, enslave myself in a marriage. And then we also have Zephyr who was brilliant, yet because she is a woman and because she is one of three wives of this guy who just keeps her trapped like a bird in a cage, she like is going crazy because she doesn't have an outlet for her knowledge and her brains and her desire to learn and create. And she says how she wishes she were a man because if she were a man, she could like apply her brains and use it, you know? And it also says how she thought she was a witch because back then that was how they explained a woman who was so intellectual they would be like, well, she must be a witch because that's not normal. And this mirrors Jillian as well because she often in the book wished she was a man because a woman can pursue her intellectual desires and it's socially acceptable, right? And then when the queen of Sheba, she tells Solomon that he needs to tell her what every woman's desire is if he wants to marry her. And so he tells her. And when the djinn is telling this story, Gillian, sorry, I keep wanting to call her Gillian because of Gillian Flynn. But anyway, uh, Jillian asks like, well, what is every woman's deepest desire? We later hear in the book that Jillian thinks that every woman's desire is to be a man because as I said, that is something she often wished throughout her life. And then she also tells the Jen a story about when she was 20 years old, she was at a friend's house because the friend was getting married and how she talks about seeing her body and really admiring like the beauty of her body because it was so thin and you know, perfect, whatever. She was only 20 years old, so her body was looking good. But how she also like was scared of it too because like she knew she wasn't prepared for it. And then the next morning, the friend's dad comes in her room to bring her a breakfast tray, but before giving her the food, he like takes her robe down and then he gropes her. And then afterwards he leaves and she just feels like so sick and disgusted. And she feels guilty because she feels like her body is to blame for what this gross man just did to her. And then the theme of the conference that she goes to in Istanbul is woman in fiction. Jillian shares the story of Patient Griselda, which is a story uh, written by Chaucer about this woman who goes through like all these different hardships that her husband puts her through as a way to test her. And then at the end, when everything is seemingly all is well. The wife kind of has this moment going a little crazy and she like almost like suffocates and she's almost strangling her children in this moment. And the book reads, the stories of women's lives in fiction are the stories of stopped energies and all come to that moment of strangled willed oblivion. And so this theme of women and stories and what their roles are is present in the book. It is a big theme and that's not really in the movie at all though. But the fact that Althea slash Jillian is a narratologist is important to keep in mind when understanding the book and the movie. And the definition of narratology is the study of narrative and narrative structure and the ways that it affects human perception. And in the movie, when they're at this conference, they are talking about how throughout the centuries, people have used myths and stories in order to understand the world around them and to cope with the world around them. And we also kind of do that today as well, which they talk about, but we use science instead of like myths and stories. And then, as I said in the book, the theme is women in fiction. And there is a part where she and a colleague are talking and they say, there must be a wonderful pleasure for some people in being other people's fates and destinies. Perhaps it gives them the illusion that their own fates too were in their hands. And so, you know, with the movie, they're talking about using myths and stories in order to deal with life 
life and to cope and deal with life's difficulties. And then in the book, they talk about a person likes to be in control of other people's fates as a way to try to feel like they are in control of their own. And so both of these can apply to the djinn and why he's there. Because one way to see this is to think that it is all in her head. So we know that when she was a child, she created someone who brought her comfort and provided good company. And since she studies stories, it makes a lot of sense that the djinn is just something she imagined. And it also makes sense why like two of the women in the djinn stories are similar to Jillian slash Alethea. And in the movie specifically, when she is at the conference, she keeps seeing this figure that no one else sees. And then he like sort of consumes her and then she passes out. And when she comes to, she tells her colleague like, you know, sometimes my imagination just gets the best of me, but you know, it's okay, I'm all right. And he tells her something about being like a child. And she's like, didn't you know I am a child? And so going back to that book she burned when she was a kid, she burned it because she felt silly. And maybe she was like getting too mature for this imaginary friend who she was creating so many realistic details about. And so she burns it. But now that she is an adult woman, you know, in her 50s, she is embracing herself more fully and especially her like inner child, you know? And so then that could show that the djinn is part of her imagination. And she created another imaginary friend in such great detail because she has reverted back to some of her childish childhood ways. And in the book, she also sees imaginary figures. And in book and movie, when she refers to this person she had seen, in both her colleague jokes that it could have been a djinn. So some foreshadowing there. Anyway, in the book, she explains to her colleague that her imaginary, you know, these people she imagines, she says that they are like a representation of her approaching death and her just needing to come to terms with it. So in the book, she creates the djinn out of loneliness, but also as a way to cope with her impending fate of death. And that just wasn't really present in the movie at all. I didn't think it didn't seem like she was scared of death per se, but that was definitely something in the book. But another way to look at this, especially in the movie, is that the djinn is real and that he, you know, drew Alethea to him in order for her to help him be freed. And this could be true of the movie, but I feel like in the book, there's not that much evidence for this theory. In the movie, when she first lands in Turkey, there's this like weird person that is trying to pull her cart in a different direction. So you could say the person is trying to pull her cart in the direction of the djinn's body. Model. And then the figure she sees when she's at the conference is someone who had been part of Queen Sheba's court. So the fact that it was someone the djinn had known, you know, the djinn had created him and was luring her to him using this figure. And then we also know through a story the djinn tells that someone who is a descendant of a djinn who has like some djinn genes, they can be influenced by a djinn. Like when he's invisible, there is someone who is part djinn and that person is able to sense him and he tries to get this guy to help free him when he's in this invisible world. Anyway, and so we know that he can have influence on people that are part djinn. And we know that Zephyr was pregnant with the djinn's baby before she wished him away. And so Zephyr and Alethea definitely have a lot of similarities. And so it seems like maybe Alethea is a diff descendant of Zephyr and therefore she is part djinn and so she therefore can be influenced by the djinn and so maybe he was like pulling her to him because she says how like it was so random that she found his bottle because there are so many shops and yet she went to that shop and that shop had multiple rooms and yet she was drawn to that room and then that bottle was in this pile of like all this stuff buried underneath and yet she like sought it out. So it would make sense that the djinn drew her to his bottle. But with the movie ending, so in the movie, Alethea is very skeptical about making wishes because she talks about how, you know, like every story about getting wishes is a cautionary tale. And I really like this aspect of her being more wary because it makes you wonder like if the djinn is real, like are the stories he's telling real or is he manipulating her with the stories he tells in order to pique her interest and her curiosity and to try to get her to wish something. Because if she doesn't wish something, he's still stuck in taboo. So he needs her to make these three wishes. Anyway, she doesn't wish anything until the very end after he tells her the story of Zephyr and how much he had loved her. And she says that she wants that. Like she wants to love someone deeply and to be loved deeply in return. And so here her wish is granted and the two of them make love and then they go to London, back to London together. And when they're in London, like because of our, the work technology of our world, the djinn, 
like he's like he calls himself a transmitter and so all of the electromagnetic electromagnetic waves with like television and cell phones and whatever it's like very overwhelming for him but it seems like he's getting a handle on it and he's getting better and Alethea is just very content and happy just living her life knowing that she has the gym to come home to however the technology does end up being too much for him and one day she comes home and she finds him in the basement and he is like almost being turned to dust and so she uses her second wish to wish for him to speak and that kind of revives him and he gets up and he starts talking and he's acting like he's fine even though he clearly is not and so she uses her third wish to wish for him to go somewhere where he can be safe and healthy and alive and so then he leaves and she packs up you know his jacket and the slippers she wore when she met him she packs it all up and puts it in a box in her basement next to the box with the memories from her husband and then we flash forward three years and we see that she is writing about the djinn in a book just like she had written about her imaginary friend when she was a child and in voiceover we hear that the djinn visits her from time to time and in this last scene he walks up and the two of them are spending time together and so we hear that he visits her and will bring her comfort and hang out and how he always stays longer than he should because of the effect of the waves and whatever. But he always makes sure to come back and visit her throughout her lifetime. And if we see this as being in her imagination, then we can assume the reason he started dying when they went to London was because she wasn't using as much brain power to keep this imaginary person alive because she was busy going to work and like living her life. And so he therefore ended up crumbling and like turning to dust almost. And so she wishes him to be safe, but also because she had wished for them to love each other, that is why he still returns, is because of that love that is still connecting them. Again, if you think of this as being in her mind, you could see this as her like fully embracing herself and loving herself more fully, because the djinn is just an extension of herself, right? So a story of self-acceptance in some ways, if you think about it. And if you see him as being a real person or a real thing, then really it's just a story about two people who fell in love. I mean, if she wished them to be in love, but it's about two people who are in love, but they can't stay together for long because they can't exist in the same realms of existence. And so they therefore only have these fleeting moments throughout her life before that they can spend together. I personally like the idea that it was all in her mind though. I think it's a more powerful story when you think of it that way. And like I said, in the book, it makes more sense too. And I believe that is what the book is implying is that it is in her mind. And moving on to the book. So in the book, Jillian actually makes her first wish right away. So as soon as he says she can have three wishes, her first wish is to have, I forget how she words it but it's like to have her ideal body and then later on in the book is when we hear that story about when she was 20 and that guy groping her and so we find out that her ideal body is the body she had when she was like 32 because it may not have like looked ideal like in a worldly sense but it is, it is when she was the most confident and comfortable in her body and no longer was scared of it or anything you know and so initially when she wishes for a nicer body because she's in her 50s initially when she wishes for that in the book I was like really like, is that the message of this story? But then when we hear more about her past, it made a lot more sense. Anyway, her second wish is the same where she wishes for the two of them to be in love. And after she makes this wish, the djinn says, you honor me. And maybe you have wasted your wish for it may be well that love would have happened anyway since we are together and sharing our life stories as lovers do. Love, said Jillian, requires generosity. I found I was jealous of Zephyr and I have never been jealous of anyone. I wanted, it was more that I wanted to give you something, to give you my wish, she said incoherently. You give and you bind, said the djinn, like all lovers. You give yourself, which is brave, and which I think you have never done before. And she again brings him to England. Like he, they talk about the electromagnetic waves, but it's not really as much of a thing and he seems fine. And then soon after they go to Toronto for another conference. And there the title of her speech she is giving at this conference is called Wish Fulfillment and Narrative Fate, Some Aspects of Wish Fulfillment as a Narrative Device. Again, that is very wish fulfillment and using wish fulfillment as a narrative device is like exactly what Jillian is doing with her creation of the djinn, right? But in this speech, she tells a story about a man who has unlimited wishes and he wishes like wisely. He doesn't wish anything crazy. However, each wish he makes makes the giver smaller and smaller. And so he ends up wishing for the giver to make a wish of his own. And once he does, the giver disappears and the man's life basically returns to normal. And a line from this speech reads, characters in fairy tales are subject to fate and enact their fates. Characteristically, they attempt to change this fate by magical intervention in its workings and characteristically too, such magical intervention only reinforces the control of the fate which awaited them, which is perhaps simply the fact that they are mortal and return to dust. And so again, this could go back 
to Jillian creating the gin as a way to feel like she is in control of her own fate. And like I said, like fear of her impending death or just coming to terms with the fact that she's getting older and will die. And so maybe she's creating this gin as a way to escape her fate. But ultimately that's gonna end up happening anyway, right? Anyway, when she returns, she decides to wish the same thing that this man had wished, which is for the gin to just return and go where he wants. And so they spend like one last evening together and he buys her this really elaborate glass paperweight because by the way, she collects glass paperweights and that is one reason why she was drawn to the bottle. Anyway, he buys her this new glass paperweight and then they make love and then he's gone. And then we hear like sometime later, she is in another shop in New York City and then he appears in that shop and he once again buys her these two glass paperweights and they like spend this time together. And the two paperweights he buys her, one is of a snake and the other is of a flower. And the snake is symbolic. It's something that comes up a few times in this book. The first time it comes up is when she is thinking of, you know, the story of Adam and Eve and the snake in Paradise Lost. And in Paradise Lost, John Milton writes that the snake is floating redundant. And she says how she, or she herself, she just likes that phrase, but she also feels like as a woman, she has become redundant but yet in her career as a narratologist, she is not redundant. And the book has more going on, like before she meets the djinn, there's actually quite a bit with just Jillian and her life and her with her colleagues. And there's actually a scene where she makes another separate wish while they're in this like sacred room with this pillar. And she also goes to this museum and is, is told stories by this man who may or may not be a djinn. And I have only read the story once, but for anyone who has read it multiple times and has studied it more, like, there's just so much to this. It's a novella, so it's short, but there's just so much symbolism and all of these stories, because there's so many stories within the story. Yeah, I feel like this is one that I could read multiple times and like really annotate and highlight and figure out all of the different overlapping themes and symbolism within this book. So if you are someone who has done that, I would love to hear your comments down below on your thoughts on this book and different the different meanings and the different symbolisms throughout. And then the name of this title, by the way, it's called The Gin in the Nightingale's Eye because that bottle that he was in is called The Nightingale's Eye. And the way it's described in the book is exactly how it's shown in the movie where it's just this glass bottle where it's stripes of blue and white or clear, like spiraled. But yeah, very beautiful. But yeah, getting back to the symbolism real quick, I feel like there is symbolism in the fact that when he returns to her years later, he buys her a paperweight that is a snake and a flower. I think the second one was a flower. Anyway, so I'm sure there's something there, but I would have to like go through and read it again and really think about it. But as far as the gin stories real quick, I didn't really get into detail too much with those because they're basically the same in both book and movie. Honestly, the movie might have elaborated it a bit more because a lot of the movie is the stories of the gin as he goes back telling his life story essentially. But yeah, the book doesn't elaborate any more on them. I thought it would, but it actually almost tells you less. <laughs> I mean, maybe not less, but anyway, the only difference is in the movie, we have that guy who was part Jin, who the Jin tries to draw him to his bottle. And that wasn't in the book. There was no guy who was part Jin. There was a guy, which the part Jin guy in the movie, he goes to war and after war, he is like very bloodthirsty and everybody is scared of him. But then there's this old storyteller and this old storyteller is the one that is able to calm him. But then when the storyteller dies, this guy like loses his will to live basically and he dies and his brother is made king instead dead and his brother is the one who likes large women and he stays in this like stable lined room. And in the book we have a guy who was very violent and people were scared of him but he was not brothers with the guy with the large woman dressed in sable which in the movie the mom like has that guy go in the sable room with all these women. I was confused why they don't really explain that like she says how he's not fit to rule but it's like so why did you lock him in this room? <laughs> I don't know. In the book the guy himself like reads about someone staying in a sable lined room and so he's like oh that's what I'm gonna do too. So it was his own idea in the book. Anyway it is one of his wives or concubines who ends up finding the bottle because she like slips and it breaks the tile and then she finds the bottle in the ground and that's in both book and movie. But I did think the movie showed really well like his love for Zephyr and how it caused him to be controlling and like the book and movie both show this but how he like wanted her to be trapped in that room because Althea is like why like didn't you encourage her to leave the room? She could have wished to leave and not be with this guy anymore. But the djinn also wanted her trapped in that room because if she was out in the world she would be distracted and find other loves and passions whether it was you know another person or something else that just took up her time and eventually she would use up her wishes and he wouldn't be tied to her anymore. So he ends up being controlled 
controlling. And in the movie, it says how he like wouldn't want her to talk because he would worry she would make a wish that he wouldn't like or worried that she would just make a wish, period. And then they would no longer have this connection. And so just showing how love can be controlling in that way, but also showing how like the djinn is a slave to the wisher, but the wisher can also be a slave to the djinn. So that was really interesting. Uh, but to wrap it up and do book verse movie, I think I covered all of the things I wanted to. I hope this has made sense so far. But anyway, like I said, I was so excited for this movie, but I'll be honest, when it ended, I was kind of like, I took it at face value and I was like, so it was a love story? <laughs> like that's that's all it was and I was a little disappointed however pretty soon after I watched Fish Jelly's film review for this and they both really liked it and so and they're talking about it and explaining why they loved it so much I was able to appreciate the movie all the more and like I said initially I took it at face value where the gin was real but they kind of talked more about the gin being in her imagination and so that made me like the story more and then like I said later that day I started reading the book and so the book having that backstory also made me love the movie all the more as well. Like it just has more layers than you might initially think. So if you watch this movie and initially don't really like it, just give it time to settle and to sit with you and to watch other people's videos such as this one. And I think it is one where the longer you sit with it, the more you love it. That, at least that's the case with me. But a lot of the details of the movie that I loved did come straight from the book, including the fact that when the djinn first appears, he is giant and how his foot was stuck in the bathroom door. Like that is literally what happens in the book as well. And just him like taking people out of the TV. In the book, he takes a tennis player out of the TV, but in the movie, it's Albert Einstein. But yeah, so, so many of the details, like the visual details, which were so cool, in the movie were from the book and it was just really cool to see them brought to life but the book is also just so vivid and such great imagery and descriptions and you feel like you're there so the details in the book were really good too uh, but it was cool to see it played out in the movie in the end i do think like i said in the book it seems very clear that the djinn was part of her imagination whereas the movie you could debate on whether or not he is i feel like there's an argument that could be made for both sides though ultimately i think he is in her imagination and that is what i I like better. Also side note, in the end, when he comes to visit her, when she is writing her book about him, the world she's in in that moment, like it almost looks fake because it's like these blue skies and this green field and something about it felt otherworldly. And that made me wonder if she was dead, but maybe I'm reaching with that. I don't know, what do you think? In which case, maybe it was like the book where her creation of the djinn was part of her impending death and coming to terms with that. Let me know if you agree or not with that theory. Anyway, when it comes to book first movie, it's really hard to choose because I loved the movie. It was so cool seeing it brought to life. George Miller is an amazing director. The performances were incredible. It was just such a vibrant film too. And, but then I really loved the details of the book and learning more about Alethea and all the stories. There's so many more stories within the story in the book. I think ultimately I will say that the book wins, but it's a close call. It's like almost a tie because I did really enjoy the movie and I'm already wanting to go see it a second time, especially now that I've read the book. Anyway, let me know your thoughts down below. If you saw the movie, what you thought of it. Let me know if this, if this video helped you gain a better appreciation for the movie. And let me know if you've read the book and how you thought the book and movie compared. And don't forget to subscribe to my channel and give my podcast a rating and review, which I forgot to say. <laughs> you could also listen to this as a podcast if you don't wanna have to watch the video. Should have said that at the beginning. But anyway, thank you for your support for watching this video. And yeah, I will see you next time. Bye.